Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today for Sabbath school teaching, we have Danielle and Elisa and myself, Byron. And we look forward to today's lesson, The Roots of Restlessness. But before we do anything, Elisa, could you open us with prayer? I would be happy to. Dear Father in Heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day and the safe path through the week. We pray that your presence will be with us today as we embark on this study. There's a lot of important lessons here and things for us to apply to our life. Help us to have ears to listen and hearts to to actually do and perform and incorporate what we learn. We pray that your spirit will guide us as we read your word and um, understand your message that you have for us today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start off with the memory verse for today, and that is James 3.16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. So today's lesson is about the roots of restlessness. We're going to see how pride, selfishness, ambition, that is in a bad way, and hypocrisy are truly roots for an unhappy and unfulfilling life. If we looked at every example of pride in the Bible, we'd run out of time for the lesson. But although pride and ambition often walk hand in hand, the one that stands out to me about pride is Peter in Matthew 26, 31 through 34. And Jesus said to them, you will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. We all know what happened at the fire pit at Caiaphas' house now, don't we? Let's take a look at selfishness in the Bible and how it affected the prodigal son. Luke 15, 11 through 13. This, and he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give, to, or give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now that's something. The younger son asks for his inheritance before the father dies, then runs away from the family to live it up. No, that's not selfish. Okay, it really is. Sounds like every one of us probably when we are young, perhaps. And then when it comes to ambition, I think John and James pull out all the stops in Matthew 20, verses 20 through 24. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the 10 became indignant with the two brothers. I love that. They even tried using their mother as an angle or an edge for their own advancement. Now that is something. That, that's ambition. And finally, hypocrisy. From the Greek word hip, hypokritos, or krites, which originally meant a pretender. It was used, a word used for actors, pretended to be something they're not. Galatians 2, 11 through 13, Peter's hypocrisy. But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, and this is Paul speaking, because he stood condemned. 
For prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. I love that. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the one who stood up for Saul and brought him in, is even carried away by the hypocrisy and distancing himself from the Gentiles, which God clearly said, I, salvation is for them as well. That is some powerful sin. Oh, I mean restless roots. Really, you know they're the same. So on that note, Elisa, can you tell us about Sunday and how Jesus brings division and how all these things work in? Sure, that would be great. So let's get started with this day's um, topic and read Matthew 10:34 to 39. And it says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves sin, oh, excuse me, who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus' words seem to be counterintuitive to this quarter's theme of rest in Christ. Throughout the Bible, we learn of Christ's work to reconcile fallen man to God. We read of Christ leading nations and people out of slavery, calming the seas, raising the dead, healing the sick, comforting the heartbroken, and indeed in Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah in Isaiah 9-6, Christ is called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So are these words of Jesus in Matthew 10 contradictory to what the Bible teaches about rest in God? And what does Jesus mean when he said he did not come to bring peace but a sword? So to understand, let's take a look at that first sentence in verse 34. Jesus said that he had not come to bring peace on earth. Indeed, throughout the Bible, we see conflict on this earth between God and Satan, between good and evil, between fallen man and God's law. And as we read in verses 35 to 39 of Matthew 10, often this division is with family members and those closest to us, making this conflict very personal. Let's take a look at a few examples. In Genesis 3.15, we read, that after Adam and Eve's fall, the Lord said to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And in 1 Kings 17 and 18, we read of the conflict between Elijah and King Ahab, and between God's people and the prophets of Baal and the apostate government. And then in Matthew 26 and 27, we read of Jesus' betrayal by one of his disciples, Judas, and denial by Peter, and the abandonment by the other disciples when Jesus was taken away. In fact, in Matthew 26, 57, it states, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Furthermore, in Matthew 10, Jesus said that if we love anyone more than him and do not take up our cross and follow him, then we are not worthy of him. These words expand upon the first commandment, which is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. To receive true rest in Christ, we must choose to put him above everything else and follow Christ's example of being fully submitted to the Father's will. So in summary, when, when Jesus came 
and there was division, it was essentially the effect of Jesus coming to earth and not his purpose. So Daniel, would you like to go ahead and expand on some of these human traits that are the roots of our restlessness? So uh, Monday's lesson, it's titled Selfishness, and it's uh, what I'm supposed to cover. And I must tell you that I started preparing, sort of thinking this is an easy thing, I'm going to do it just fine. But as I was preparing and looking at definitions for selfishness, causes and effects, it's almost like as the more I looked, the more I was, things were throwing, I became sort of dizzy thinking, how am I going to cover this? It's just too overwhelming, too big of a subject. There's so many aspects to it. So I had to kind of pull back, pray, and look back at the Bible to find a definition for selfishness, sort of in a backhanded kind of way. So join me on this exploration. Uh, we're going to look to deduct this definition at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So it states, therefore, and this is the Apostle Paul talking to the Philippians, and he states, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy and being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or con conceit. But I'm going to stop for a second. What he's saying to them, he's doing sort of a flower introduction to them, and he's saying that he loves them and that they're in his heart, and if they could fulfill, he had joy in them, but he wants that joy to be complete, and he's asking them to do this. And what he's asking them is, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So literally, I'm doing a reverse definition here. <laughs> if we are not selfish, then we would be doing things without selfish ambition, and we would be doing it with lowliness of mind. So if we are selfish, then we would not be doing it for others. We'd be doing it for ourselves. We would not be esteem others above us. We would kind of think we're most important. And uh, we would not be looking at other people for other people's interests. We'd be looking for ourselves. Really, that's the definition deducted backwards from this text. And you can see where this is probably the simplest form that I could find of, of figuring out what it means. It means purely thinking of others. And we're looking at examples in the Bible we know already um, as we've studied Christ and as we looked and the things that drew us to Christ is exactly that, that he always looked out for others, that he always looks out for our interests, that he puts our future, he put our future above his life. Mm -hmm. um, so it's becoming very clear as we st stop and meditate on that. But let's continue a little bit. There's another text. It's like um, in Mark 8:34. He's giving us a command, basically. He's saying when he, uh, they're talking about Jesus, uh, and he's saying when he, in other words, Jesus, had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, so when he's calling them for service, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in other words, denying my own desires and my own selfish um, wishes, take up my assignment that the Lord has given me in this life, that's my cross, my assignment, from him, not my assignment that I've come up with, and follow him. That's the directive. So we can see the direction of the Bible, not that we didn't see it before. It's, it's what we've been studying all along since we've become Christians and we've been noticing and that's what attracted us. We would see the beauty of it. The beauty of it sparkled to us and caught our eye and then we explored it and wished to be just like him. 
But let's look quickly at a couple, a few examples in the Bible of selfish people because we will see selfish people, they come of all sorts of varieties. And they're not necessarily always selfish, they're, but we all experience some selfishness in our lives, so we are not exempt from that. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone that, me included, that hasn't been selfish more than should. But here we go. The first example that I want to mm, review briefly is Cain. And we already know the, st the story with Abel and Cain uh, when they were, they were Adam and Eve's first children and they uh, gave um, their offering to the Lord and uh, Cain became jealous of Abel. As, as he became jealous, why did he become jealous? He was literally looking at his own selfish interests and he didn't care what God wanted. He didn't care uh, to the point where he ended up committing murder. murder. So that's kind of like our one of the first examples. I mean, we can debate Adam and Eve to some degree, too. Um, but we won't go there. Ahab, <clears throat> King Ahab. So King Ahab was a fairly evil king. He, he was selfish, and he really wanted um, Naboth, one of the neighboring uh, plots of land close to his palace, and he wanted that vineyard. He really wanted it, and he was very upset because Naboth didn't want to sell it to him. And uh, Jezebel said, what? Why are you upset? Just kill him. And sure enough, he, he thought that's a brilliant idea, and he went right ahead and killed him. That's like textbook selfishness. And he didn't, when he got, it says that when he, when he received the property after Naboth died, he rejoiced. So there was no, he never stopped to think of one minute of Naboth or his family or anything or anyone, but wanting a vineyard. David, now David, maybe we can compare him in some ways to us because we are hardest for the Lord and so was David's, but he also faltered and he made a incredibly selfish decision when he, because he desired Bathsheba, he killed his own beloved general in order to save his pride and get her at the same time and cover for his um, sin. Uh, but he turned around. But that's another example. And so on and so forth. I'm going to stop there because we can really go at infinitum and that's not what's important. What's important is really the invitation that God has for us through his example to us and the invitation that he has for us in in not being selfish. We already reviewed in Mark 8.34, but we want to see his example. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says, uh, and this, um, yes. Uh, so here is Paul. He's describing to the Philippians. We read verses 1 through 4 in the very beginning when he's inviting them to, uh, you know, esteem others above themselves and to help others. And then he goes right into these verses and he continues telling them about Christ. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in, every, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So when, when we're looking at this, this is, uh, and I'm gonna summarize this section and end it with these verses, but I'm going to talk just a little bit about the verses. This is considered like the cascade of love that Jesus gave to us. And it is the most stark example of lack of selfishness, which is what we aspire to. He was God, all powerful, and he left it all aside and he went down to one, I mean, to, he made himself equal to us. He came down here, but not only equal to us, he went and took it a step further he took it to servant level, and not only to servant level, he cascaded it even down further 
to death. And not only to death, but the worst kind of death on the cross, all because he wanted us to be with him and all because he was looking out for us. Amen. Amen. I love that. There's a phrase um, that I've heard many times. It says, heaven is a place where everyone is more concerned about everyone else than mm. themselves. Mm. I like that. Mm. So we're going to look at um, Wednesday, or actually Tuesday, an ambition. Mm. Oh, where do we begin? Mm. Ambition in its own right. What is ambition? The definition, according to Merriam-Webster, is the ardent desire for rank, fame, or power, which is what people think mm -hmm. of, or a desire to achieve a particular end or goal. Another definition is an object of ambition. In other words, you had an ambition to start your own business. And the third definition is a desire for activity or exertion. Mm -hmm. and, and the opposite of that, for instance, an example would be if you felt sick, you had no ambition at all, no motivation to do anything. So, is ambition a bad thing? Not necessarily. Ambition in and of itself isn't good or bad. It depends on what you're ambitious for. We have plenty of bad examples of ambition in the Bible. I'm going to read a few of them for you. Um, we're going to take a look at Luke 9, 46 through 48, <clears throat> the test of greatness. An argument started among them, this is the apostles, as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this, this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among you, this is the one who is great. And I actually want to read, I'll go ahead and read it, Matthew 18, 1 through 4. It's very similar. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Well, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We can look at Mark 9, 33 through 35. We see a pattern beginning here, by the way, in Scripture. Um, Mark 9, 33 through 35. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? So apparently they're having, talking about something before they got there. But they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed which one, or which one another, which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Now, they're disputing which one of them is the greatest in the Last Supper. And this is in the lesson in verses 14 through 30 in Luke 22. I'm only going to read 24 through 27. And there arose a dispute among them as to which of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is greatest among you must be like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. In other words, the ambition of the world and the ambition for the kingdom of God are complete opposites. And we see in Matthew, and you can see even Jesus is equating this, they have authority over them. They have power over somebody. And yet he's saying his greatness comes from giving and not lording it over anyone. Your greatest gift you could ever have is to give. So in Matthew 20, 20 through 24, and we had this in the introduction, um, the mother of the Jam, Jane, or John and James, 
petitioning for their sons to be at first and second. So they literally are trying to buck for the first and second position of powers right after Jesus. And that is something that, that still confounds me. So what was the ambition of the disciples? What did it really come down to? To be in a high-ranking position in the new kingdom. And what was their goal in this ambition? Well, it's the world the goal. It's power and prestige. To be part of the power behind the throne, as the saying goes. The Jews have been taught for the longest time that the Messiah would reestablish the throne of David and be king of Israel. And Israel would be reborn again, reestablished. And they clung to this hope. Even just before Jesus ascended to heaven, we read in Acts 1.6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? They just didn't get it. And you look at Judas Iscariot. He had different ambitions. We're going to read John 12, 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, and this is when Mary Magdalene puts the spike on Jesus, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Today, we call that embezzling. Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, page 293, While Jesus was preparing the disciples for their ordination, one who had not been summoned urged his presence among them. It was Judas Iscariot, a man who professed to be a follower of Christ. He now came forward, soliciting a place in this inner circle of disciples. With great earnestness and apparent sincerity, he declared, Master, I will follow you, or follow thee, wheresoever thou goest. Jesus neither repulsed nor welcomed him, but uttered only a, a mournful words, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has not where his lay, ha, hath not where to lay his head. The old English always gets me. Matthew 8, 19 and 20. Judas believed uh, Jesus to be the Messiah, and by joining the apostles, he hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. This hope Jesus designed to cut off by the statement of his poverty can you imagine Judas if he liked to pilfer from the money box? What it would be to be the money keeper of all Israel? So love of money, another bad ambition, seemed to have gotten the best of him. And money, just like ambition, it's not good or bad, it's how you treat it. So even when betrayed, uh, but even when Judas betrayed Jesus, it was out of selfish ambition, trying to push Jesus to become king, still looking towards his own advancement. But before ambition gets too bad of a name, let's look at some good examples of the Bible. Saul had an ambition to wipe out the Jewish sect called the Way, Christians, and he was zealous for it. Okay, that's one more bad one. But on the road to Damascus in his conversion, Saul had a new ambition, professing Jesus as the Christ and winning souls for God. How determined was he to do this? We read in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, I'll just give the highlights. Five times he received 39 lashes from the Jews. He was beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked, and dangerous from rivers, from robbers, from fellow countrymen, Gentiles, danger about everywhere, in hunger and thirst and without food, and in cold exposure. Now that's some ambition, because the first definition was that you're determined to do accomplish something. So we have to ask, and that's a good ambition. There's many of them in the Bible. But I have to ask, what's your ambition? Is it fame, status, wealth, power? These are the standards of the world. Maybe you just want to graduate from college and get a good job. Find that special someone. Get married, start a family. These are all good things. But hopefully, we all have some ambitions Otherwise, you're seeking to accomplish absolutely nothing, which is a dangerous place, to, a dangerous place of idleness to be. 
So for those with ambitions, whatever they may be, do any of your ambitions involve God and his work on this earth? Any of them? If not, you know you're sentencing yourself to a lifetime of restlessness in your heart and restlessness in your life, let alone robbing yourself from the gift that God offers you, the gift of eternal life with him. Luckily, we have a God that's waiting for us to come to him, just as we are, so that he can transform us into something better and give us rest in him. I pray that all of us would be ambitious with our lives for God. Now, Lisa, can you tell us about hypocrisy? Yes. So as Byron had mentioned when we started the lesson, the Greek origin of the word hypocrisy really, really refers to an actor or someone who portrays themselves as something that they are not. Jesus used this word to refer to the scribes and Pharisees, calling them out for saying one thing and commanding others to behave in a certain way, but then not doing what they said. We sometimes make light of hypocrisy in our culture. So have you ever heard someone say, do as I say, not as I do? So I know I've heard that. Mm -hmm. However, Jesus was very serious and had little tolerance for the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Let's read Matthew 23, 1 to 13 to see what Jesus said about hypocrisy. And it says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the border of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So what are some of the main characteristics of hypocrisy that Jesus describes in the verses above? Well, one he is that he says um, people are saying, or the Pharisees and scribes are saying one thing and doing another. And number two, a characteristic was they were making religion harder for others while not applying the same standards to themselves. A third characteristic was self-aggrandizement and promotion, wanting others to applaud their religious fervor. And number four, we see that um, they were seeking for oneself the honor and recognition that is due only to God. So in verses 13 to 36 of Matthew 23, Jesus goes on to pronounce the seven woes against the scribes and Pharisees calling out specifically their hypocritical actions and the coming judgment. But even in his harsh criticism of the Jewish religious and political leaders, Jesus still loves them, and we find him in verse 37 to 39 lamenting over their stubbornness. Ellen White comments on this in The Desires of Ages, and she says, 
Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon his hearers. In a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wing, and ye would not. So Daniel, can you help us understand a little bit about how we can uproot some of these traits that really get in the way of our rest in Christ? Um, uprooting restlessness, Thursday's lesson, my assignment. Um, when, when we're looking at the list of things that uh, affect our rest, so to speak, and make us restless, uh, the things that we were reviewing in this lesson, because there's so many variations, but um, we were reviewing specifically division and selfishness and ambition and hypocrisy and, uh, as impediments to us truly finding rest because with this quarter is all a study about rest and arriving to this elusive rest and how does it come about. Um, the first text that I like to, but before a text, we are in a battle. We, as Christians, when we have chosen the side of Christ, Satan is attacking with all its forces. And it, it, we are, um, our lives are resulting in a lot of restlessness because we are under attack. And actually, on this earth that we live, which is so engrossed in sin, um, life seems to be restless continuously for most. But as Christians, we have experienced rest and peace. And the Bible tells us very clearly why we experience rest and why and how. It's the fact that we know how it will all end. It, it, we don't have the unknown in front of us of what the future will bring. In John 14, verses 1 through 6, it tells us, Let not your heart, and this is an invitation to us, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So this was the invitation from Jesus uh, before his ascensions, where he is telling them that, and it's passed down to us as the same invitation. We know that the battle is victorious. This war that we're on, it's not only a battle. The entire war is going to end victoriously. And that we will be forever with the Lord. He is working at preparing for that. That is the way we remind ourselves. That fact in itself gives us peace. And uh, then in John 16, 13. However, when he... The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So not only God has done this invitation, but he has made a provision for us that the Holy Spirit would help us through. So with the help of the Holy Spirit and through his authority, as we hear, we will be transformed. And in Philippians 1.6, we're taught to believe with confidence, being confident that this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So there is no way that the Lord, if we turn our lives to him, if we look to him, there is a complete and total assurance that he will complete his work in us and we will make our destination. That is our source of peace. And Mark 8.34, which I think I read in the previous section, but it's, be, it's good to remind ourselves. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We have clear directives. That's how we um, 
get peace by following his com direct and complete instructions. And uh, Isaiah 26, 3 to 4, you will keep him, this is a promise, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For Yahweh, the Lord, is everlasting strength. We um, are assured of perfect peace. And how is having my mind stained on the Lord? So I, Daniel, if, as I'm going through my activities through the day and I'm having challenges or things that are, um, for a reason or another, making me um, lose my peacefulness and become restless. Maybe I'm starting to uh, think of things from my perspective and not of others' perspective. Um, I have a directive. I have to keep my mind stained on Christ. So I have a direction. I have to return to think of him. And if I falter and fail, we are also told in Jeremiah to return. There, he's inviting them to return. So let's keep remembering the promises. And the final promise that I'd like to leave you with is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unfailed face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Do you have any Amen. final words? Yes, I do have a, a few words. I, I, in my previous section, I had a text that I pulled out that really bears to remind us um, what the remedy for uh, selfishness is. And it says in Galatians 2.20, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the Galatians. And as he's talking to the Galatians, he's telling them his position and he is inviting them along. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the invitation that we would go along and do the same as the Apostle Paul and as Christians. And he's talking to his beloved Galatians, um, and he's talking to the beloved Laguna Gillians. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to all of us. us. Right. Yeah. Elisa, yes. any final thoughts? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, at, at the root of most, if not all, sin is love of self and pride, um, if we want to look at it from that perspective. It's like, who sits on the throne of your heart? And if self is sitting there on the throne of your heart, there's very little room for God to sit there. Sure. Um, but at the same time, what you mentioned about ambition in terms of ambition in and of itself is not bad. It's what you do with it. Love of self is not bad either. In fact, in the Bible, it, um, we are told that we should love our neighbor as ourself. So God knew we would love ourselves, because if we didn't, there probably would be very little self-preservation. Mm -hmm. right. However, again, it is what are you doing with that love of self? Are you putting it on the throne of your life, or are you submitting it to God and having him on the throne of your life? And right. I think that's the difference. Does it supersede your love for God? Right. Excellent. And I know I, I think... I, I had a thought. Yeah. And it's because I, I had a thought that the Lord wants us to change our ways from looking at things specifically, changing from grasping to giving, mm. changing from um, self-promotion to promoting and taking care of others, exactly mm -hmm. what Christ did, mm -hmm. and from um, focusing on self again focusing on others and that in itself com won't come natural but it will come as we keep looking at the Lord and following him it's just he'll t make it happen mm -hmm. amen amen and I'd like to read for final thought something from Ellen White steps to Christ mm. chapter 5 consecration <clears throat> God our God's promise is ye shall seek me 
and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And that's Jeremiah 29, 13. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such words as dead and trespass and sins. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. No soundness in it. We are held fast in the snare of Satan, taken captive by him at his will. And that's all in Ephesians 2, 1, Isaiah 1, 5, and 6, and 2 Timothy 2, 26. God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. I'm going to say that again because it's, it's, we are our own worst enemy. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. When we look at it, pride, selfishness, bad ambition, and hypocrisy are all rooted in our carnal flesh. I mean, we're born to sin, or at least tendency for it, and we'll remain in our bodies until we're either glorified or deceased. I've read enough self-help books in my past to know that if I change my behavior, eliminate a trigger response, and if you've ever read these things, you know these phrases, or even if you believe by yourself, you've uprooted one or all of these roots of restlessness, you're deceiving yourself. Just like the weed in the garden that has only part of the root removed, mm -hmm. it will grow back and grow back quickly. Yeah. As Ellen White stated, by yielding ourselves wholly and completely is the only way to be transformed into his likeness and to stifle those roots growing. So, and really even Paul talks about it in Romans in chapter 7, verses um, 14 through 21, about the conflict of the two natures. We're born to sin. So here's the petition. Are you coming to, cr to the cross daily, surrendering yourself to God and coming to the foot of the cross so that you, you may have his life in you and that your life may be put to the side? that you can have that life abundantly through Christ Jesus and that God can stifle the growth of those roots so that you may actually produce good fruit rather than bad fruit. That's the petition. That's something we all need to do for all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you see all of this behind us, it is VBS Sabbath. So the lamb and the elk and all this. So just so you know, we're not on a movie set. Yes, we're still yes. Laguna Niguel. <laughs> And on that note, um, let's pray. <laughs> let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, you are the source of light, life. You are the source of light as well. You are the source of everything that is good, pure and true. Even when Jesus was asked and said, good teacher, he said, only God is good. Lord, our prayer is, that you dwell in each and every one of us, that you open our eyes and you open our minds, that we truly might see the condition that we are in, and that you might put it in our thoughts, the condition you want us to be in, Lord, that we might grow closer to that original image of you that we had in the Garden of Eden. Lord, only when all of this is done, and sin is done away with, will that come to pass? But Lord, you can transform us every day of our lives. Teach us to seek that. Send the Holy Spirit to impress that on our hearts, that we look for it daily, that it becomes a habit or a ritual in our own lives, that we may truly see the wonderful things that you have in store, not only for us, but that you want us to do for others on this earth 
to represent you proudly and boldly, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and grace and the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who without his sacrifice, none of this would be possible. We pray all these things to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.